Voilà, mesdames, messieurs. Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good uh, evening. Welcome to the third uh, conference of the 18th uh, Wright Colloquium for Science. The room is full, which just goes to show how interested you are in these uh, colloquia. My name is Olivier Desibou. I'm a scientific uh, journalist. I'm going to MC this evening during the round table this evening and on Thursday and Friday for the last two presentations of the week. As you know, we welcome wide, world known uh, scientists from all over the world and they're obviously very happy to share the results of their research with you. This evening we're going to talk about energy, which is colorless, as you'll see. There is a common denominator to all the conferences this week, uh, gravity, whereas this evening perhaps we are going to talk about anti-gravity, and uh, you'll know more about this in a few seconds. So we'll listen to a presentation by for 45 minutes in French, translated into English. For those who want to listen to English, please uh, get a headset. And the round table will be in English because we'll have with us on stage the speaker for tomorrow evening. So again, we'll have an interdisciplinary discussion in English with translation into French, interpretation into French, and you can put your questions in French and in English. I would ask you not to switch off your mobile phones. Why? Simply switch them on to silent, but keep them on because you will be able to put questions via Twitter Apart from putting the questions live by using a microphone, Thierry Courvoisier, the president of the Wright Foundation, is going to field the questions, and this will be a possibility, an opportunity for those who are listening to us uh, by web streaming to put questions via Twitter. As I said, it did work rather well the two previous evenings, so we're going to pursue the experiment, try it out. If you are getting frustrated because you haven't been given a mic, you have an additional opportunity to put a question. No, there's no 2G network. We're on 4G now. Um, so before we get to down to business and to uh, assess the gravity of the situation. Yes, I know it's an easy pun, but um, this evening, I think we are going to discuss one of the greatest mysteries of this week's theme. Uh, there's a mega question about uh, all this. So before I give the floor to this evening's speaker, I'm going to give the floor to Thierry Courvoisier, the president of the Wright Foundation, who's going to say a few words of welcome. Bonsoir. Good evening, one and all. Welcome to this evening's event. Cosmologists say very proudly indeed that they are into accuracy. And I must say they are right to a certain extent because the parameters that characterize the universe are known to us all in all their details. Nevertheless, the studies would have us believe that 90% of the studies that tell us that gravity exists in the universe are not understood. So there is a science, cosmology, based on relative, uh, on general uh, relativity, which describes quite accurately our environment in the large scale by using um, matters that, that uh, whose characteristics we are not familiar with. So to travel in this universe, we need to talk about gravitation. And I'm very happy to see that Claudia de Ram took on the invitation made to her by the Wright Foundation to accompany us in this walkabout. Thank you, Thierry. So, 
As per usual, somebody from the University of Geneva is going to introduce this evening, uh, s this evening's speaker, Root Derer, who teaches at the University of Geneva, is going to introduce the speaker for this evening. You have the floor, madam. Good evening. Uh, I'm very happy indeed to introduce Claudia Deram. She's a Swiss national. She comes from across the lake in Lausanne. She spent eight years as a child in Madagascar, and uh, she started reading physics at the Polytechnic in Paris and then the Polytechnic in Lausanne. She left Switzerland and went off to read for her doctorate at Cambridge and then did post-doctorate post uh, studies in Canada. She came back to Switzerland. She was assistant professor at the University of Geneva, and that was the opportunity that was given me to get to know her better and to learn that she's not only an extraordinary scientist, but a very pleasant and friendly personality. And I was very happy to work with her in a group. She obviously is very enthusiastic uh, about all things to do with physics. And she dispensed her lectures on general relativity with uh, a great deal of gusto. And I can think I can call her a friend. Unfortunately, she went off again on her travels. And uh, it was a bit complicated because uh, we couldn't find uh, work for her husband. So she went off to the United States of America to uh, Great Western uh, She as a, an assistant professor. And then she became an associate professor. And as of 2016, she's back in Europe. She teaches at the Imperial College in London, uh, where she's a full-fledged professor. Her research is uh, theoretical cosmology and more specifically gravity theories or effective theories of fields. And she is well known for her theory on massive gravity. She developed a theory that was first uh, uh, proposed by Viertel and Hertz in the uh, 40s. And, uh, they came a cropper because of something that wasn't possible, and she nevertheless found a way and come up with a consistent theory of gravity where she describes uh, gravitons with a with mass and that are nonlinear. So she's been awarded many prizes and rewards. Uh, for instance, this year, she's been awarded the Adams Prize first-class international research on mathematics applied to physics. She was shortlisted for the Blavatnik uh, Prize for Young Researchers, and she was always so given uh, the Wolfson Prize. Uh, University Consolidated Grant, which is one of the most prestigious grants awarded in Europe. She's not only a well-known and re successful researcher, she also has uh, three little girls who I'm sure are going to become well-known researchers like her, like their mum. So, Claudia, you have the floor. Thank you, and thank you for being here this evening. So this evening we're off on our travels. I hope you've fastened your seatbelts. We're going to travel to the far side of the universe, and what's interesting is that we're going to start on this journey together, but we're not going to end the journey together. The final point, it's up to us, all of us, to find it. It could take us days, years, 
hundreds of years, but I'm sure we are going to get to where we're going at one point in time, perhaps not in our lifetime. So to travel in the universe is also to look at our past, and we'll start looking at a past which is not so far off, not so far off uh, geographically speaking. This is a park in Cambridge. I don't know perhaps... Uh, a lot about this park. It's a, an ordinary park, but for 700 years, for 1200, since 1211, it was one of the places where there were a lot of people that would congregate every year. There was the Starbridge Fair, which took place in this part, and the famous visitors who came along, and in particular, in 1665, one of the persons who came along to this uh, fair was uh, Newton, who attended uh, university just around the corner. So we're familiar with his work and uh, his work on apples that fall on the ground. This is how he understood and thought about the theory of gravity. It was the first time that there was a mathematical equation that uh, was written about it, this phenomenon, and he made tremendous contributions to science. At this fair, he came upon the principles, Euclidean principles, which are the very basis of the theory of uh, geometry and gravitation. The reason why I'm showing you this picture of Newton is that at this fair, that's where he bought his first prism. And it's thanks to his prism, Newton's prism, that he understood for the first time that light is a spectral superposition of waves at different frequencies, at different colors, and the way in which a prism functions because it refracts the waves of light. Light travels in a vacuum at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second in vacuum. But if we're not in a state of vacuum, if we're in water or air, or glass, as we see here on the screen, the speed of light is slightly different to that um, vacuum and depends on the frequency or the color or the wavelength of this color. And so when the light hits the glass, it propagates at a speed which is slightly different depending on the color, and that is why we have color diffraction, and that's what Newton understood. And these are the observations that we can make every day, every day of the year. We look at this uh, phenomenon, and uh, we look at this rainbow, and we all know that there are um, droplets of moisture, and thanks to rainbows, we have a good idea of the elements that are to be found in the atmosphere and in the sky. We don't need to travel there. Just because we look at the rainbow, we understand what are its constituents. So perhaps there's something similar, not perhaps for light, but for gravitational waves. Do we have rainbows of gravity? And I'll answer uh, this question straight away, it has been observed yet, but this doesn't stop us from looking. And if we came across rainbows of gravity, or even if we didn't see them, at least we would have some indications as to the composition, not of the sky, but of the whole universe. And uh, Monday evening, Professor Damour talked to us about this, and we'll learn more about this, this tomorrow evening. But gravitational waves were detected for the first time ever a few years ago. And this is what happened in 2015. This is the 2015 event. It was the first time that uh, uh, gravitational waves were detected live using interferometers. Now, these gravitational waves to come to us have uh, traveled 100 uh, light years 
several billion light years, and they propagated on such distances. And when you look at their spectrum, if we understand whether there are gravity rainbows or if there's a change in their relation of dispersion, perhaps we could better understand the composition of the universe. And when you look at the universe, on a large scale, on a huge scale, if we go beyond our galaxy, we see that the composition of the universe is very mysterious indeed. We can't really see it, it's observed, but if you look at these distances of the size of a galaxy, so 100 uh, light years, we see that all the matter, I'm talking about matter, all that we are aware of, that we are familiar with, uh, ourselves, the chairs, the air in this room, the planets and all the stars and all the interstellar dust, all this matter, all this mass which is visible but not necessarily visible, but all this visible matter cannot help us understand the total mass of the galaxy. So, by looking at the movement of the stars, this is a symbol. It's If you look at the movement of stars and the periphery of galaxies, you can understand, have an idea of the size of the galaxy. The mass is greater than the mass of the galaxies. And to explain this big mass of the galaxies, which is greater than the visible mass, you have to posit the existence of black matter, and you know that galaxies and uh, clusters of galaxies are plunged in clouds of dark matter. So again, this is a, 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 an artist's uh, representation. You don't see the black, the dark matter. It's just to give you an idea of what we're talking about. The clusters of galaxies are plunged into the clouds of dark matter. We cannot communicate with this matter. It doesn't emit light. At least we haven't been able to detect any light. It doesn't interact with us. But we know that it does have a gravitational impact and stars and the way in which the universe develops now. If we focus on this point of the universe, we see that it becomes even more uh, mysterious. We're talking about distances equivalent to billions of light years, cosmological distances and I want you to keep watching the screen just to give you an idea of the distances we're talking about. And if we want to understand how the universe behaves over these huge distances, this dark matter, this black matter, doesn't help us understand completely the behavior of the universe because the universe is expanding this is an observation that we have been making for a number of years now. And we see that when we look at stars or star explosions happening very far away, they all move uh, compared to our position. It's got nothing to do with our position. Everybody, wherever in the universe, see the same thing. We can all see the same thing, and we see this on this diagram. Uh, you see how a number of objects, the celestial objects, uh, explosions of stars, how these objects move vis-a-vis -vis our position, their speed vis-a-vis -vis, uh, ourselves, and this is a unit of distance that we like to use in cosmology. And the further the object, the more it will move further away. It's an expansion of the universe in all directions. So as soon as we say the word expansion, we immediately uh, have a question that comes up. And we would like to know where is it expanding? And I'm going to give you an answer which you're not going to like into nothing. There's nothing else but the universe. The universe is all the space, is all the time. Outside the universe, there's nothing else. There's no notion of space outside the universe. There's no ruler that will allow you to measure anything. There's nothing. It's just the universe. So very often, we 
uh, shown these pictures to the evolution of the universe. And the reason why this is presented, because I cannot cut up the uh, transparency. Uh, there's nothing, and I cannot represent it, but it's not really a space outside universe. The universe, it's nothing. So the universe is born, but it's not what I'd like to show you here. It's not a point in the universe as of which something developed and became something else. This is wrong. There is no extremity to universe to the universe. There's no edge to the universe. We think that the universe, from its inception, from the Big Bang onwards, from that point onwards, already was infinite in size. So infinite is something. Infinity is something that we are. Uh, find upsetting. We uh, are ill at ease when faced with infinity. So it's rather difficult for us to think about something which is finite. But it is possible. I mean, we don't think that this is necessarily the case. It's quite possible that the universe is closed and therefore it could be finite, it could be a sphere, it doesn't necessarily have to be a sphere, but it could be a sphere. When I think about the surface of a sphere, it's uh, something which is two-dimensional and to represent it in my imagination, the surface of a sphere, I have to take out one of the dimensions of the universe, and I only have to think of two dimensions of our universe, and I have to imagine that it's closed up as a sphere. And then it's easier to imagine what we mean by the university is expanding. So on the surface of this globe, of this sphere, this globe, this sphere, it's expanding, it's ballooning. And you can see that any galaxy at the surface of the sphere is becoming even more removed from one another. And when you're at the surface of this uh, sphere, there's no point in particular, there's no center, there's no focal point. And outside the surface that we think about by adding a dimension, there is nothing. There's not another dimension of the universe. It's not another dimension. It's just a way we have to try and represent what we mean by when we say that the universe is expanding. Now, back to gravity. So what's gravity got to do with all this? Well, gravity is an attractive force. When I uh, threw the apples towards you, you all thought that the apple was going to fall on your head, but I didn't want to throw uh, an apple that was too heavy because it would have hurt you. But we're used to the fact that this gravity is an attractive force. And if I think of several masses, several galaxies, gravity is attractive. Therefore, it should bring these galaxies together. If that's not the case, we imagine that there's a force that decreases the expansion of the universe. So, in other words, if we look at what's just happened quite recently, we could expect that what we're looking at right at the beginning of the uh, universe, it was expanding, but we could expect th that the universe is going to contract or that this expansion is going to come to a halt one day. But what does this Hubble diagram mean if we travel even further, greater distances, so this means looking more into the past, and if this expansion is diminished, this means that the objects in the past travel more quickly than the objects that are closer to us. So if we look at what's happening mm, a long, long way away, we could expect that the speed of these objects vis-a-vis -vis ourselves is greater than what is closer to us. So this is what we should expect to happen. But my colleagues can go and check what's happening with certain objects. And what they've observed is exactly the opposite. So 
This means that the objects that are further removed, that were in the past, they move away from us at a speed that's slightly slower than the speed we expected, and that's not a good sign. This means, in other words, that the expansion of the universe is not decreasing, it's increasing. Not only is the universe expanding, but this expansion is taking place at an increased pace. So this is the reason why the uh, Nobel Prize was awarded in 2011 for the discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe by looking at the explosion of far removed supernovae. So this is something we've been able to observe. But as a cosmologist, we have to try and understand why this acceleration is even happening, because ordinary matter that we makes us all up, atoms and the dark matter, the clusters of galaxies that are plunged into this dark matter, they don't want to see the expansion of the universe accelerate. We would expect them to uh, decrease the expansion of the universe. So to explain this, we have to posit the existence of another substance, a new substance, which we're going to call dark energy. But when we call something by a word, doesn't mean that we understand. I could call it anything. It's just a name we have given out of ignorance to try and explain the reasons for the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. We know that we're not just talking about masses that exist locally because this wouldn't lead to an acceleration of the expansion of the universe. This dark energy is no doubt some sort of mm, substance in density, energy, density of mass, and it's constant or quasi-constant throughout the universe. And to try and analyze this even further as to what this dark energy could be and the origins of this dark energy, we try to go back to the origins of ordinary matter and try and understand ordinary matter what we are made of, all the matters that we are made of, the earth, the air, the air is made up of molecules, of atoms, of electrons around a nucleus made up of neutrons and protons and quarks. And the quarks and electrons and all these other particles are the particles of the standard model of particles. <laughs> This standard model includes all particles that make up matter, including all the particles that are making up uh, fundamental forces, uh, where you see the equation phi is the Higgs boson that has been discovered at the CERN, at the LHC. This was a rather comical way of representing all these particles. If I'm showing you this, it's because it's more fun, of, obviously, but also because it shows that graviton is present as a fundamental particle. I think you've all heard of this mystery, uh, how can we associate gravity with other forces or with other particles from the standard model. But at low energies, perturbatively, there is absolutely no problem to include graviton amongst all the other forces and particles of the standard model. You can include it rather easily here. It could also be possible to include some part of physics beyond the standard model in order to include or incorporate dark matter, which would explain why uh, or how the energy from galaxies is propagating. All these particles from the standard model, those which make up matter, those which create forces, strong and weak forces, the photon here that transmits the electro electromagnetic force and graviton that transmits gravitational force, all these particles are part of the standard model. You could add up 
the graviton to this. But all this matter, we think, is concentrated in galaxies and in galaxy clusters with dark matter. This is a combination of sim numerical or digital simulations based on analysis and observations and it shows us how dark matter structured itself into clusters of galaxies and then galaxies and solar systems etc etc within these structures the whole amount of matter dark matter and visible matter is concentrated is in these structures but the dark energy is diluted everywhere, not only in the structure where galaxies and clusters of a galaxy exist, but also in the vacuum between galaxies and clusters of galaxies. This dark energy, we know that we have very little interaction or hardly any interaction with it. We try to communicate with it through gravity. As such, this dark energy is present everywhere, here in this uh, room, a little bit here, over there. But the density of energy, I'm going to translate that into density of mass, because we know E is mc to the square, so there is a relationship between mass and energy. This density, relationship of density in dark energy at a local level, if I take one cubic meter, that kind of volume, if it was water, it would weigh a ton. But for dark energy, it weighs 10 to the minus 28 kilo. It's very, very small. It's tiny. It represents, it is as if it was the mass of, a, of an ant in the volume of a cube that has 10,000 kilometers per side, nearly the size of the, the Earth. This explains you why we couldn't, we could forget about mark, dark energy. When we send rockets to the moon, there's no point in trying to incorporate the effect of uh, dark energy in, on Earth, in the solar system, in the whole galaxy we are living in. Dark matter doesn't count really, but it is spread all over, all over the whole universe with a rather constant rate of energy. And since it is present also in the vacuum, look, looking at what happens in the vacuum could give us an indication of what this dark energy could actually be. If you take off all the galaxies and if you zoom in into the infinitely small of one part of the vacuum, even if I try to take everything off, take away all particles, matter, neutrinos and everything, there will still remain something that, rem that expresses itself in form of energy. Quantum fluctuations which are present everywhere in the vacuum, maybe you can't detect them through a machine, but they are still there. These fluctuations are quantum fluctuations that give the vacuum an energy. The vacuum is not empty. It is not devoid of energy. All the particles we've named earlier on have quantum fluctuations in the vacuum. The vacuum is not empty. Maybe you think I'm uh, saying the same thing in a different way, but it's not true. Our idea of vacuum, of absence of particles, is not empty of energy. There still is energy in the vacuum through these quantum fluctuations. More than in the f formulation of the standard model with all particles or waves associated or fields associated to particles, where you expect these uh, quantum fluctuations of vacuum that would be present everywhere in the universe and would therefore have a constant density, that might give us a very natural explanation to the origin of dark energy. As a matter of fact, 
we have on the one side our cosmological observations that tell us that the universe is expanding. Not only it is expanding, but it is expanding at an accelerated rate. And on the other hand, you have the standard model with the field theory, the quantum field theory, which tells us in the vacuum there should be quantum fluctuations leading to an energy with a nearly constant rate everywhere in the universe, and that might explain the accelerated expansion of the universe. For some of you, it may be too easy an explanation. I believe that there may be in the room some very wise people who might uh, ask uh, awkward questions afterwards. So let's make a calculation. Let's take some particles, the particles from the standard model. Let's take the Higgs boson, for example, because this is the new star of the show. We know its mass, 125 giga electron volt. We're speaking here about mass, 10 to the minus 25 kilo. And we're going to try and assess the contribution of the Higgs boson to the energy of the vacuum. And we'll try and see whether this is the right order of magnitude and enough to explain the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. If you take quantum theory, you always have a duality between particles and waves, and there is no exception with the Higgs boson. It was considered as a particle, but actually it is also a wave. There is a kind of duality of discretion in between the two. If you consider the Higgs as a wave, it obviously has a wavelength associated to its mass, which is the inverse of its mass. So a rough estimate, but which should be rather accurate, tells us that this energy coming only from the Higgs boson should have the following contribution. One Higgs boson in a box corresponding to the wavelength of a Higgs boson. The length of the Higgs is that kind of uh, magnitude, 10 to the minus 18 meter. We are not quite used to, use, to, to working with that kind of magnitude. So I am decided to illustrate that with uh, points of comparison. This is about this helps you comparing things with uh, what we know, from a watermelon to a molecule of water. Nine orders of magnitude. Now, if you take the order of this, uh, the size of this box, you should uh, diminish it again by nine orders of magnitude. Just to give you an idea of this, of the tiny volume we're talking about. So let's take that. You have the mass of one Higgs boson in a box of that size. The density of the Higgs boson or the density of the energy of the vacuum coming from the Higgs boson should be more or less the mass of the Higgs boson divided by the volume of this box. We are going to calculate that altogether, and that should bring us to an answer of 10 to the 29th kilo per cubic meter. Let's compare that with what we needed to know about the accelerated expansion of the universe. And now you have a big problem, because the figures are quite different. The figures are more or less the same one, but there is a minus sign here. It's 10 to the minus 28, whereas according to our calculus, it is 10 to the plus 29. There wasn't a mistake in my writing. There are indeed differences with on the one side plus and on the other side minus. This is an estimation based on our theory, which is extremely valid and uh, enabled us to predict the Higgs boson and it was working very well in any situation. And when you compare that with what we need to explain our, our cosmological observations, you see a difference of 57 orders of magnitude. This is the huge uh, error, the major mistake in the whole history of science. 
Now, if you make a mistake by the next time you calculate, you calculate something, you'll be able to be uh, relieved by saying at least it's not a difference of uh, 57 orders of magnitude. And I have no solution to explain this discrepancy. The only thing I can say is that, obviously, if it is the energy of the vacuum, we have to rethink about everything that we've been thinking about so far. Or maybe the origin of the accelerated expansion of, of the universe is not due to the energy of the vacuum. Maybe there are compensations between uh, various uh, other elements that I haven't taken into account in my calculation. So we, in that case, we are back to our initial question. What is the origin of this dark energy? What is it actually? And this is a very actual and, and uh, valid question we're all thinking about. This is a diagram of the various possibilities uh, which I created in 2008, 10 years ago. And uh, last summer, I tried to uh, organize all the other possibilities that surged up in the meantime. Galileo, chameleons, membranes, multiverse, extra dimensions, everything is possible. We, have full, we are full of ideas, actually. But what we need is to calm down, to come back to the origin, and to try and understand how it is possible to make a distinction between all these models. Is one of these models really uh, enough to explain dark energy? And we're going to go back to our point of origin, this rainbow, maybe this rainbow could give us ideas about what dark energy is or isn't. Because gravitational waves are propagating in the universe through mediums that may not have uh, dark matter but may have dark energy. If there is an interaction, even if tiny interaction between both, maybe we'll be able to detect that and ex observe it through appropriate uh, means, through the, relation, uh, the, the dispersion relationship of gravitational waves. In 2017, for the first time, we observed not only gravitational waves, but linked to them electromagnetic l waves, light in other words. This was already mentioned uh, on Monday, and maybe we're going to talk about that tomorrow again. But that had tremendous consequences, because from that point, we were able to determine with a, an extreme accuracy the propagation, the velocity of propagation of uh, gravitational waves. As you can see here, during the whole process of merger between two whole black holes, uh, gravitational waves are created, and just after that, electromagnetic waves were also emitted. These were electromagnetic waves that have been uh, observed a few days after the event at frequencies that are slightly different uh, from then uh, th those that were uh, observed or emitted earlier on. Of course, this is an artist's impression. It hasn't been seen with the naked eye. But these gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves traveled 10 to the 15 second lights. In other words, they took 10 to the 15 seconds to come to us. And yet, they arrived exactly at the same time as the first light signals. Maybe with two seconds difference. And you can even understand these two seconds difference because light hasn't been emitted exactly at the same time as gravitational waves. Which means that gravitational waves, even if they have a frequency that we have observed here in Hertz, which is extremely different from the one uh, of uh, light waves, both propagated exactly at the same speed than light. Which means that Dark energy, or at least at these fre frequencies, must be transparent vis-à-vis -vis gravitational waves. Gravitational waves went through the whole cosmological medium. Despite the presence of gravitational waves, this dark energy affected in no way 
the gravitational waves that have been observed, which gives us a, an extremely precise indication on the uh, diffraction index of dark energy for the frequencies that we have observed it at the LIGO laboratory. At these frequencies, we do have very accurate measurements of what could be the diffraction index of dark energy. This is at least a quantity or something that we know about dark energy. Now, in the future, we hope that other missions will be launched. LISA and PTA will enable us to measure or to observe gravitational waves at other frequencies. And Independ uh, according to the uh, def diffraction indexes that we might observe, maybe it will still be one, maybe it will be different from one, at least we'll be able to deduct from that how this dark energy interacts with gravity. To conclude, as I said earlier on, I have no solution to offer to you. We still do not know exactly what dark energy actually is and it'll be probably up to you or to all of us to discover it one day. But thanks to gravitational waves, we have at least a much clearer idea of what energy isn't. And amongst all the models that I gave you earlier on, many have already been abandoned in order to explain the dark energy. And I'll conclude now with a quotation from Marie Curie who said, you don't have to fear anything in life. You just have to understand it. My homage is to Marie Curie because uh, she is now 150 years of age. I suppose that you know who was Marie Curie. She was the first woman to be awarded a Nobel Prize in physics, the only uh, among three. The last uh, woman who received the Nobel Prize was this year. And she was the only one to have received two Nobel Prizes, one in physics and one in chemistry. So happy birthday, Marie Curie. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, extraordinary travel. Now we're going to switch to the question and answer time. It will be uh, held in English. So please there ask you a question both in French and in English. There is a simultaneous uh, translation. And for the discussion, I have the great pleasure to invite on stage our speaker uh, of tomorrow about gravitational wave, which is a, a good point because you mentioned so many times gravitational waves. And this is Gabriela Gonzalez. Please. Is it possible to have some light in the room so that I can see the, the questions arising? Thank you. Uh, Gabriela, so I'll present you in a very few words. So you're one of the co-discoverers, if I can say that, of the first observation um, of the gravitational wave in 2015, which were announced uh, two years ago. Can you tell us, I mean, how it helps, in your words, how it helps to kind of decipher this mystery of dark energy? Well, Claudia actually explained it really well. <laughs> wait, wait. Mike? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. <laughs> that sounded like a cell phone <laughs> advertisement. Cloud explained it really well. Actually, I don't know much about these predictions, but I'm with gravitational waves, with the observation of gravitational waves, <clears throat> excuse me, we are learning already a lot of things like masses of black holes that we couldn't see before, learning that they are in pairs, learning where they are, and 
seeing a rainbow of gravitational waves to explain dark energy, seeing how they propagate through space at different speeds, it's something that we would love to do. I think it's going to take a little while, though. <laughs> Uh, Claudia mentioned uh, the vacuum energy. So we have, in a way, to imagine particles popping out of the vacuum and then disappearing again into the vacuum, right? Is that creating gravitational waves so that we can maybe see them sometimes? <laughs> you are getting into very dangerous territory. <laughs> <laughs> In principle, yes, because in principle, all you need to produce gravitational waves are masses that are not in a spherically symmetric configuration that are accelerating. And particles and antiparticles being created and annihilating themselves do that. However, you are at an energy level where classical theory of relativity, Einstein's theory of relativity, breaks down. So you cannot really apply to phenomena at that energy scale, at that length scale. We need, and there are many people working on um, unifying, having a theory that explains both the quantum phenomena and the gravitational phenomena. And there are a few predictions out there, but we don't have a way to test them yet. So we need more experiments, or we need predictions that we can test. Uh, Claudia, there's something you, you didn't mention at all during the presentation, and this is the so-called cosmological constant. This is a term that Einstein added to its equation at the time because he was, you know, uh, disturbed. He added this, this term to have a kind of static universe. And this cosmological con constant is often linked to, to dark energy. Can you explain yeah, how so, and, and why? So this vacuum energy is a cosmological constant. It is exactly a cosmological constant. <clears throat> I didn't use the term cosmological constant, but it is the most likely, the most natural explanation to dark energy. Uh, it would be just by vacuum energy is a, so, is, is a natural candidate for the cosmological constant. Uh, what, what's interesting indeed that Einstein put the cosmological constant as a term that one can put in Einstein's equations uh, for relativity. Um, and at the time, the reason he introduced it was because observations were sh there was no observation of the expansion of the universe. At the time, people thought that the universe was static. Uh, but he could understand that there was all this stuff present in the universe, there's galaxies and everything, all the stars, so, and he, he understood that this would m make the universe evolve. Uh, and therefore, he thought, well, if I add the cosmological constant at the time, that could possibly make the universe uh, being static, compensate all the, the stuff present in the universe and, and keep it static. Uh, but in reality, while in principle it would, you could find a solution for which the universe would be static in the presence of a cosmological constant, it's not a stable solution. In the sense that if you have found this static solution, you add just a tiny little bit more stuff and then the universe collapses. You add a, just a tiny bit more cosmological constant, and then the universe uh, expands and actually accelerates. So it's not actually a, a, a stable solution, and he removed it. Mm -hmm. Since the observation of the accelerated expansion of the universe, then people have put it back on. Uh, but putting a term in your equation is not a physical explanation of what's going on. Putting something there doesn't mean that you understand what it is. It is something a priori we can put, but it has the same cosmological constant problem as the vacuum energy has. This vacuum energy is what contributes to this cosmological constant. And if we expect it to be huge when we observe it to be extremely small, it doesn't, it doesn't match the observation. So we need to explain why the cosmological constant is so small when it has contributions feeding into it, which are the ones from macro energy, which are large, huge. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's the cosmological constant problem, which is the reason why people have explored alternatives to just having a cosmological constant. So let, let's come to this, to this point. Uh, but before that, let's come back to this huge discrepancy. Uh, you mentioned a, f a factor of um, a power of 
57, right? Mm -hmm. I read many times 120. Yes, yeah. What's, what's the yeah. right one? And, <coughs> how, first, so, and, how, yeah. and, and then how do you deal in your formulas, in your equations with such a, a big problem? <laughs> so uh, I've given you the conservative estimation. I've given you the estimation with just stuff that we do know. We do know that the Higgs boson is present. We do know its mass. We do know its quantum wavelength. So these are all things, solid physics. And that gives you 56 or 57 orders of magnitude discrepancy. Now, in principle, you can imagine that there's physics beyond the standard model, and there'll be physics and particles, possibly, with masses all the way up to the Planck scale, which is the scale of gravity, which is the largest possible scale we can trust uh, gravity uh, in its current stage. So we can imagine that if we consider the contribution from all of this stuff, all the way to the Planck scale, then that would lead to a contribution to the cosmological constant, which is actually 120 orders of magnitude discrepancy compared to what observations tell you. So this 120 orders of magnitude is probably what we usually hear. And I would say that that's maybe putting it a little bit too far, because I don't know that we should really go all the way up to the Planck scale. If I just trust what I know there is, there's already a huge discrepancy. And that's the 56 orders of magnitude. And <coughs> mathematically speaking, how do you deal with this? I mean, <laughs> you just put one number and then you try again with another number in your equations? How do you do that? I mean, mathematically, what you can do is simply say, ah, oh, well, actually, this is zero. Uh, maybe there's a symmetry that sets it to be zero. What I haven't said is that in doing this estimation for the vacuum energy, we actually need to compute some loops, some quantum loops, and we need to explain how we're going to regularize some infinities. Um, uh, I've assumed a quite conservative way of regularizing these infinities, but in principle you could have a, an answer which is infinite. Now we never trust an infinite answer, and we always need to make sense of it and say, well, if the answer is infinite, it's because it's relying on physics that we don't know whether we can trust really. So let's just go up to physics that we can trust. Um, so mathematically, we need to understand what is the limit of, mm. of our knowledge and how we implement that in the mathematical equation. Another question, <coughs> you also mentioned it in your presentation, uh, it's called dark energy or globibulga. <laughs> but it's, it's maybe something that we don't need. I mean, there are some alternative uh, theories that just get rid of uh, dark energy. That might be something that we miss in the current equations. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a bit more about the alternative theories yeah. that, you know, that don't take into account dark energy? That's right. So, so in that sense, let me just take the perspective that dark energy, a cosmological constant is one candidate for dark energy. Let me take that perspective. So let's imagine we don't have any dark energy. That means no cosmological constant, no dark energy. Um, what is possible is that, I mean, we infer the need of dark energy because we make observations and we trust the theory of general relativity, we trust its validity up to large cosmological distances, and then from there we infer that we need, that we infer first that the universe expansion is accelerating, and that we need some dark energy to source this acceleration. But all of that is based on the assumption that general relativity is a valid description of the force of gravity on those distance scales. But? But, but the only probe that we have on gravity at these distant scales is cosmology. So we don't know that it really is the, the correct description of what's going on on these distant scales. We have no other way to, to test that. We have no, no other system which, which is so big that we could test that. So maybe the force of gravity is not falling quite precisely that of general relativity on those distances. And, and maybe that can al alleviate or completely get rid of the need of dark energy. That's a possibility. And you also said it, I mean, through uh, or thanks to the gravitational wave, uh, you can constrain or eliminate some of those uh, alternative theories. Uh, so in, in a way, your field helps a lot uh, what the theorists, uh, theoreticians are doing. Well, of course, um, my field on gravitational waves has a lot to do with believing, but also testing the Einstein's theory of general relativity. And there are many tests, there are many experiments that are dedicated to test the theory. 
in general, people like us and, and people like me the ones who mes were measuring the expansion of the universe, uh, we believe the theory, <laughs> and then we believe the predictions of the theory, but then we compare them with the data. And that's what happened with the expansion of the universe. It just didn't agree with the data. It was accelerating. It wasn't slowing down. With us, so far, uh, we don't have enough precision in our tests, but as our detectors get better and better, and as there are other detectors of gravitational waves, of different wavelengths and different energies, we might discover a discrepancy. And that will be a clue. It will probably will not give an answer to what is the, <laughs> the real theory, but it will give us a clue to look for, the, for a better theory. Uh, another theory was brought uh, very recently, I think a few months ago, by a professor emeritus of this university called André Meder. You might have heard about this, uh, and I have to go back to my notes because it's quite complex. It's called the scale invariance of the empty space. The idea that the vacuum remains invariant to scale, whatever you do with it, do you, you know, uh, uh, contract it or expand uh, it with the universe? Uh, it made some noise last year. I was criticized as well. What, what do you think of it? Have you heard about this? And what, what do you? Think yes, of it? I heard. I heard about it. I think it was a year ago, right? Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. I think. Yeah. Right. Can, can um, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's always good to contemplate every every possibility. Um, at uh, that stage, it wasn't entirely clear, at least to me, how, how much you could really help with the fundamental problem that, of the cosmological constant problem. And there's, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of... I present a problem that we have, but there's a lot of physics and observations that we, that we have. It's two very solid theories, and they're much more than theories. They're very consistent with observations and with uh, experiments on so many levels. So while I, I, I present many different models, and there are always some that, that come up, um, we have to be extremely careful in making sure that they are entirely consistent with everything that we do know. Quantum field theory and the standard model of particle physics is, is extremely... It's, it, we, can't, we don't have so much room to play with it uh, at wish. Um, and so it's not only that, but we also need to implement, to embed our thoughts into a fully-fledged theory, just like uh, the standard model of mm. particle physics. So it, it's, it's not that we can just change the properties of the vacuum um, at wish. We, we need to understand how that would come into a fully-fledged uh, theory mm. and then be consistent with everything that we know so far. So it's, it's a delicate balance uh, between the two. But still, I was struck by the, the, the harsh words used in some articles by, by your colleagues to really criticize the theory, saying, no, it's bullshit, if I can say that. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll, I won't make any comments. Okay. <laughs> So I'm turning now to the audience. Are there some, some or many questions? So I'll, I'll start here, and then Madame, and then here. So first in the front, then I'll go to the back. Um, just Monsieur en gris. Gentleman in grey. Uh, th thank you. I have uh, two questions for uh, Ms. Ram. The first one uh, has to do uh, with your findings and how it relates to the work done by CERN uh, regarding the origins of the universe. Does it punch any holes that is supported? If you could give us. The second one, I have problems uh, conceptualizing the infinity of the universe with what you said that there is nothing outside of it. I, I cannot reconcile those two things. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. So, um, with respect to the connection with what is uh, being found at CERN, um, other, what I have presented so far, I should say, it's not my findings. It's, it's, it's the community finding. Uh, I, I have almost no part in, in playing into these findings. So the, the finding that the universe expansion is accelerating is that of my colleagues, is, is not mine. And the cos cosmological constant problem or the vacuum energy problem has been formulated not by me, but, but my others. So my contribution is in working towards uh, trying to understand them. Um, 
but in uh, connection with what has been um, uh, done at CERN, um, the energy scales are very different. So, so what we're dealing with here is something which is at the level of distances of the whole universe. So in terms, if we want to translate that in terms of energy scales, it's extremely low energy scales. That's what we're observing. We, we, we're looking at something which is extremely low, <clears throat> and the amount of vacuum energy that we need to have, as I explained, on our everyday life already is extremely low, so compared to um, certain energy level, it's extremely low. It's not something that will interfere with certain um, experiments at all. What, what's going on at CERN is, is very high energy experiments. So it's, um, they are complementary uh, and they're completely consistent with one another. What, what CERN does is more related to uh, quantum field theory, to the standard model of particle physics, and gives us an understanding of the description of the particles as particles and as waves, really as we call them fields, and how we can think of the quantum corrections um, given by them. And, and our understanding of that is completely, absolutely consistent with what is done uh, and needed to be done at CERN. People look at the quantum loops at CERN, they have to compute it to a very high accuracy, to a high number of loops, and it's all... Our understanding is exactly on the same page, um, so it's all consistent. With respect to the... S Second question, the... To uh, the limit the of... Nothing the, 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 yes. You know. This is counterintuitive, but it doesn't make it wrong. It, we, we are not meant necessarily to be able to picture that. Uh, we are, we're not very comfortable with dealing with infinities. But it doesn't mean that the universe has to be finite. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that. So, so, I mean, there is our issue with conceptualizing it, and then there is nature. And certainly what nature does has, doesn't care about how we, <laughs> how we think of it. Um, However, if it's too hard for us to think of having the universe infinite, we, it is not completely inconceivable that it is actually closed. And maybe that's simpler, or not simpler, but it's, it's something that we can conceive, having our universe being closed, uh, and then it would have a, a finite volume of, of that closed surface or 3D uh, surface. That's a possibility. Observations don't seem to be going to that direction. It doesn't seem like the universe is necessarily closed. It, it could be especially flat or especially open, which would mean that it, it would actually be infinite. So the universe is infinite. It's possible that the universe is infinite in, in size, but we still talk about the volume of the universe. We still talk about the size of the universe. I'm, I keep talking about the, the cosmological scales of the size of the universe. What I mean by that is the observable universe. Because the universe expansion is accelerating, there's objects which are very far away from us, that are moving so fast away from us, that the light that they emit they will never be able to reach us, and so it will be unobservable from us. So in this sense, this universe has uh, an observable edge. But it doesn't mean that there's anything physical there. The observable universe for me and for you is slightly different. Um, that's right. But yet, what we both observe in any direction is hopefully exactly the same. I, I have to say myself that, uh, of course, we all struggled with this. <laughs> I think we all, when we first learned about these concepts, we struggled. But after thinking about it, I think it, was, it is now, for me, a lot more difficult to imagine an edge to the universe, because then what is the rest? The universe is everything, so it does not have an edge. And that, to me, is more natural. <laughs> Whether it's finite or infinite, that we need observations, and that is still difficult to conceptualize if it is infinite. But having an edge, I think it, it, it's almost like thinking about the flat Earth as a finite, <laughs> a finite flat Earth on, on four turtles. You could imagine an infinite uh, flat Earth, but... Edges, I think that's the unnatural concept. There was one question here. Uh, bonjour. Uh, pour... Good evening. 
It's not really a question, but to come back to the edges of the universe, the extremities of the universe that we were currently discussing. So we know that the universe is going round, okay? It goes round, okay? We agree? It does go round? So it goes round something. I'm not going to go into details. Perhaps later on uh, we could do this uh, in private. But the speed of light is a constant, right? So if the universe is expanding and the edges are turning at the speed of light because that's maximum speed, you understand where I'm going with this? And what is your question? No, I have several questions. Yes, but come up with the first one. It's not really a question. It's a, a thought process. So the universe is going round. So it's a sphere. We agree? There's a center. We agree? Well, is the universe going round? It's very interesting. Perhaps we could listen to what the ladies have to say. Yes, but the horizon of the universe, if the universe turns and it's expanding... I don't want to monopolize the microphone, but let's say the universe is expanding, okay? Yes, yes, we agree. So it consumes energy, so its gravitational field is expanding and it's going around at the speed of light. You see where I'm going with this? Yes, but could tell us where we're going with this. Do you understand what I'm saying, Claudia? Do you understand? Does the universe go round? Yes. Perhaps we could listen to what the speakers have to say. I don't understand when you say the universe is going round. What do you mean by that? I understand something going round is going round a center. And we don't believe the universe has any special place that has, doesn't have a center. We. I am the center of my observable universe. You are the center of your observable universe. And there are, there's a very strong overlap between those two. But neither you nor I are the center of the, the universe. I suggest you continue discussion earlier on. There was later on, there's another question at the front of the room and the second row, lady third row, sorry. And then we'll switch to Twitter questions, it would seem. I have conference. Uh, pendant long time, the uh, particle virtual. For a long time, virtual particles. were often mentioned when we discussed vacuum. Perhaps this is no longer the case. Could you explain why virtual particles are no longer a candidate for further research? This is kind of related to what I was trying to describe as the what is present in the vacuum. In the vacuum, there's constantly some quantum fluctuations and constantly creation and annihilation of virtual particles. We may not necessarily be able to detect them, but they, it is there in the vacuum. Uh, and so this is definitely one candidate for, for a cosmological constant for, uh, for dark energy. On passe peut-être sur uh, Twitter. Sorry, um, uh, we switch now to, to Twitter. Let's there's one on dark matter rather than dark energy, and the person asking the question says, well, why, why do we need dark matter? Maybe we just got the mass of the objects wrong. So uh, I have to admit I'm not a, a specialist in that. I have given um, what is one of the most intuitive ways to think of um, why, we should need to have, why we should have dark, um, dark matter. Energy noir, uh, pardon, la matière noire. Um, so, so we can account for all the visible mass. So the, the, there's, um, there's all the luminous mass, and we can account for even black holes. We can account for the dust present in the, in the galaxies. And none of that is it's not that one person made a calculation and got it wrong. There's also different ways to account for all of this uh, standard luminous mass um, doesn't account for the, um, 
really the gravitational mass that stars on the edge of galaxies see. Um, and it's not just a, a small error, actually, the, just the luminous mass that we can account for is only 5% of the total mass of the galaxy. So it's, it's a big discrepancy. It's not that we just forgot to count one or two stars. It's really a big thing. And even if you think, well, maybe there's a bigger black hole at the center of the galaxy than what we would have expected, it still doesn't account for all of that. But more importantly, this is just one of now many evidences we have, cosmological evidences that we have, on the existence of dark matter. I've shown that uh, simulation, it was a numerical simulation that showed um, how dark matter get clusters, clustered into, filament of ga of, um, into filaments and how that led to the seeds of clusters of galaxies and then of, of galaxies. These, these are numerical simulations that account for the existence of dark matter and we couldn't make any of that, we couldn't make sense of the current universe if we hadn't accounted for all the dark matter that needs to be present. We, the whole evolution of the universe that we observe today, which is consistent with observations today, only makes sense if dark matter is present. If it isn't present, um, it, it's not compatible with what it is we, we're observing, from not only just from this... Uh, a galaxy rotation curves, but from X-ray in one part, from structure formation in another part, from the observation of the cosmic microwave background in a third part, from many different types of very complementary cosmological observations. And there's a, another question which is uh, then related to dark energy, which maybe we can paraphrase a little bit from what was, uh, from what was uh, asked directly, and that is to know whether the density of the dark energy is changing with time. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, the real answer is, since we don't precisely know what dark energy is, I, I don't know the answer. Um, if it is a cosmological constant, or if it is really dark, uh, the, the vacuum energy, then we would expect the density itself to remain constant. Uh, but if it is a different type of dark energy, then the density could itself slightly decay uh, in time. That's possible. In principle, we could conceive um, the fact that it, the density could increase in time. Typically, models that would predict that, they, they're, not, they're not very stable. That, but in principle, we could conceive that as well. I'd like to go back for once, uh, or in the middle, there's, there are two question, questions here. So the man with the red shirt, please. I would have a question to both panelists. Um, how would you react to um, the idea known in India and based upon medial perception of sages that there are billions of universes. And the other uh, position, <laughs> a bit more intermediate, uh, in the Western academic world, that there are multiverses. What, how do you deal with this? I let Claudia give the scientific <laughs> answer. <laughs> but I have to say that I find the idea of parallel universes, multiverses, uh, different universes beautiful, but very difficult to test. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a different, there's a difference between things that we like to believe or things that we want to believe as a scientific theory that we can test. And so far, at least from what I understand of multiverse theories, there are not yet predictions of, uh, that could be tested. It's an idea, but, and, and there are many theories like that. And that doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means that we can't decide scientifically whether they are true or not. But at the same time, some say that the black holes are, you know, entry doors to this other universe, or could be, or so. And, and you're working on black holes, on, on LIGO, am, et cetera, yes. on merging of uh, black holes. Yes. And with Lisa and Elisa and Lisa coming in space in 2035, yes. 20 years, 
and astronomers have been working with black holes and we have been looking at uh, in different ways at black holes and we cannot tell <laughs> whether inside the black hole is a door to another universe, because we cannot tell what's inside the black hole. Now, there, there might be ways to see what happens. It might be that, for example, uh, we see a black hole evaporate, <laughs> and then we can see whether there's something that remains in there. Of course, that uh, current predictions for how how long will, will it take for the black holes that we know to evaporate are certainly beyond the, the life we have, the life our solar planet, will, at least our Earth will have, so we won't have time for that. But there are ways about perhaps creating small black holes that evaporate faster. That's something that has been talked in CERN. So I don't discount the idea that we could test what's inside the black hole. But I don't, we don't know at this time. We cannot tell what happens or doesn't happen inside the black hole. Let, let's talk about the idea, and I'm here transforming myself into a cosmologist for a while. No, but that our universe is surrounded by a multitude of other universes. Could that be the reason that it, it, you know, it's, it's exploding and accelerating in its explosion? Could that be... I mean, the attraction of those other universes around our universe could, might, might, why not explain? So that, that, that's, that's already kind of accounted for. We know that um, the observable universe, that's not all there is. There is an infinity of things around us, just part of the universe as well. So that's already accounted in, in the understanding the expansion of the universe. So it doesn't account that this expansion should be accelerating because you can think of it more locally that... If, if you have something very far away from you, it's not going to have a huge effect to you. Uh, so, mm. so having lots of stuff beyond our horizon won't necessarily help us understanding what the expansion, ac the accelerated expansion, would be doing. There are um, some notion of entropic principle where the the only <laughs> only reason why uh, this cosmos are constant, we're trying to find some alternatives, is because it's it's natural, what I would call natural value or natural contribution for macium energy is so much larger than what it is um, observed. And there are there are some thought formulated along the lines that maybe it doesn't even need to be multiverses, but maybe there's different phases in our universe, or maybe they are multiverses and different that take just different realizations, and we just happen to be in a realization of the universe where the bottom line is that the cosmological constant or the dark energy is small, and if it hadn't been small, then we wouldn't have been here to observe it and to ask ourselves this question. This is possible, but it's extremely hard to prove. It's extremely hard to find signatures of such a thing. And so, is it really <coughs> physics, if we can't never disprove it? Um, or is it more of a, an explanation that satisfies us, mm. but, but we want to do physics, we want to explain it, and if we, if we can't find any ways to disprove it, um, we won't, we'll never be able to prove it, we'll just be able to be satisfied. But you're bringing an interesting point. Will observation always be the final judge on everything that you're doing, observing what is being theorized by... Yeah, it's by very you. important, yes. yes. Yeah, that's, that's what we believe in, in science in general. It's not only observing it, it's reproducing it, having reproducible observations. I mean, that's, what, that's the basic, uh, basic, basics in medicine, right? I mean, it's not just physics, it's science in general. It's only, only if you can reproduce the experiment, the observation, and the explanation works for all those experiments, then you have a good theory to make predictions and to work with. There was one question, yeah, just there, and then we come back to Twitter in the front. Please. Thank you for a great presentation. Uh, quick question. Um, at, a, at a moment in your presentation, there was a slide with a myriad of different theories that are now competing. Of those theories, um, and there was massive gravity that was mentioned by Professor Durer that is your work um, particular. 
Um, how many of these theories discount completely uh, dark energy, and does massive gravity amongst is massive gravity amongst them? You yeah, are very sharp. If you manage to see <laughs> massive gravity out of all of all of those, um, so is one part of the question: How many of them discard the need of uh, dark energy? Um, in reality, not many, maybe uh, three or four out of them. Most of those models, they would um, they replace, they, they, they lead to a new candidate for dark energy. Most of those models, they would um, postulate the fact that the cosmological constant of the vacuum energy is zero for a reason that we can't completely explain at the moment, but maybe there's a symmetry that would set it to zero, and maybe there's something that evades us in computing more precisely what the vacuum energy is or the quantum corrections to the vacuum energy is. Um, so it has to be actually zero and lead to a new candidate for dark energy. There's a few of them. Um, massive gravity originally was one of them, for instance, that um, tried to um, accommodate the cosmological constant problem. As for the fact that well, maybe this seems to be a discrepancy between the value of um, the accounted value of vacuum energy and what it is we are observing. It seems to be a discrepancy because, once again, we're using the laws of general relativity, um, and that's where the contradiction is. And so, if we if we modify the law of gravity, maybe uh, this amount of vacuum energy is actually what is responsible for uh, the acceleration of universe. Uh, there's no theory, including massive gravity, that can really prove that this is done in a successful way right now. Uh, this was the aim for massive gravity, in particular for all the theories which are analog to that. Um, it's not entirely disproven, but it, no one can say that it's really doing what it is supposed to be doing. There's, it's a very hard thing to do. Um, as, it was part of the question, the standing of that theory, um, respect to observations? No. Okay. It was just curiosity. Does, is it one of the th three or four theories that in somehow can bypass the whole question of massive energy, uh, of uh, dark energy? Yeah, so some of, of these theories, they just accept vacuum energy the cosmological constant, as being the source for the acceleration of the universe. So we, we go back to Twitter and then Monsieur there. Yeah. There is one, one question which uh, actually comes from somebody who says um, all of that rests on observations of supernova, supernovae very far away, uh, being just a bit fainter than what you would expect. So the effect is relatively small to which you would add that we don't know the physics of supernovae that well. We have to tweak a bit around to make them uh, standard candles. So in the end, how sure are we that the universe is accelerating? So again, the answer is very similar to what the answer for dark matter was. I presented one um, I didn't even mention too much the, the notion of supernova, but I mentioned this relation between velocities and distance of objects, and that's what leads us to the belief that there is um, acceleration, and what's, that's what the Nobel Prize was given for. But it was really given for recently, uh, and not when it was first discovered, because in the meantime, there's been so many other cosmological observations that all really converge to precisely the same observation than what, uh, to, to the fact that the universe is accelerating, and that they rely on very different physics, on very different distance scales, again, from the cosmic microwave background, from structure formation, from very different baryonic acoustic oscillation, um, which is very different independent physics from different teams, but but I would rely on independent physics they, they, that all converge to precisely the same thing. So, we are very sure. Before I come back to you, uh, sorry, just a second, I'd like to add something on, on this. Um, it was 20 years ago, but were we here in 97, we wouldn't talk about this at all, right? So, this discovery opened so many questions. That's the beauty of science as well. How, 
I mean, is it never ending? Will we ever open thousands of new doors with each new discoveries? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it's like that. Every time we, we make a new... We answer one question, we think, or we make a new... I say we, in the colloquium, we uh, make a new discovery. There's a new door, there's a thousand new doors that open, and that's the beauty of, of physics, I think. I think you can, you can tell a story. <laughs> well, I don't know which story is that. But it is true that in, in the history of physics, there has been several times, I mean, beginning with the Greeks, <laughs> we thought, as a civilization, we thought that everything was about to be known or was known already. And that has been proven wrong. Every time we understood a bit more, we understood how much less we knew than we thought we did. Monsieur. Oh. No, there's a question there, excuse me. Hello? Monsieur? Yes, thank you for your presentation. We're looking for unknown elements that repel and other unknown elements that attract. Uh, the only thing in common seems to be that they're unknown. I just wanted to be sure, because of their mode of operation and scale, we are quite sure they could not be two aspects of the same thing. Thank you. Well, for for black energy and, uh, and dark matter. So the question is, are we, are we sure? Are we sure that this dark matter <laughs> and uh, dark energy could not be two aspects of the same thing? So, so there are models that try to explore if they are connected to one another, possibly. But um, the, we, we need elements that for which the intrinsic scale is very different. As, a, as I've shown, you need to have some clustering about the clusters of galaxies uh, and, and the galaxies. So you need to have, on one side, this clustering, and then on the other side, you also need to have something which has a constant density. So you can try, in principle, to just because they are known, you can say, well, they're both unknown, so maybe it's just two sides of the same thing. That is possible, but when the scales involved are so very different, it's not entirely clear that to, it's, it's not clear that it's fair to say that we're going to explain them both at the same time, because the precise physics that we need to explain both is actually quite different. They, they operate on very different distance scales with yeah. So we have to run, but I'll take the last three questions that, uh, from the people who raised their hands, starting here. Yes. My first question has just uh, been asked by the predecessor. My second question is the following one. Scandinavian physicists said that globally the energy from magnetic waves was higher than gravity over the whole of the universe. Maybe they've been influenced by the physical phenomena in Scandinavia. Third question, is there a distortion of the curvature of space due to gravitational waves? And maybe we could uh, congratulate the interpreters. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> so, let's <laughs> <to> the... <laughs> I'll do that later on. So as far as the first two questions are concerned, Maybe we can discuss that later on, the two of us. Technical questions? So shall we discuss about it afterwards? On vous propose de, de venir poser la question directement à Madame... You'll be able to ask the question directly to Mrs. Durham because your question is slightly technical. The last question will be taken here, behind you. In order for the expansion to be continued and accelerated, you need ever more energy if you want to be able to throw away your watermelons and your apples. So the theory of the Emmental, in other words, a bubble developing in a mass of energy that has neither time nor space, and that eats up the energy from outside, because you always need more energy for expansion to accelerate, isn't that a nice theory? It could be close to reality, as a matter of fact, because you need the energy from somewhere. So my theory of the Emmental, or the theory of the Emmental that I heard of, would explain this use of limitless energy coming from the rest of the universe. Vacuum we, bubbles. That's the... <laughs> we, we really don't like the idea that energy is not conserved, but 
Um, energy conservation is actually a luxury coming from if we had time translation invariants. So if the universe was static in some sense, then we would have conservation of energy. In an evolving universe where things are not the same at different um, time in the, in the age of the universe, we don't have conservation of, of energy as we know it. This is replaced by another aspect introduced by Einstein, which is covariant conservation of the whole stress energy momentum tensor. And that's the rules that we have to, to follow. And what we're proposing, what we're working with, what dark energy is doing, is playing with that game. It is fully conserving what it has to be conserving. It's just not conserving our notion of energy as we know it in a, in a standard time way. So there's, there's, no, there's no need to, um, to explain why there is um, lack of conservation of energy. I'm it can come from the, from the geometry itself. I'm sorry, I'm going to take the last question. Time is running really late. And the last question was oui. there. Yes. Merci. Merci. Thank you very much to both of you for your extremely interesting and full explanations. My question is about the charged particles, electrically charged particles create an electromagnetic field. And it was very often mentioned uh, that that would be Higgs field. So does the Higgs really exist? Wouldn't it be possible that dark matter is explained by the Higgs field? And dark energy or dark matter? At the moment, we see no interactions uh, at the level which we're working. It's not the... The Higgs boson is interacting far too much with uh, the particles that we know uh, to, to explain dark matter. Dark matter uh, sh it shouldn't interact too much with itself even, so it, it, it's mainly interacting gravitationally. So the Higgs boson cannot accommodate for, for dark matter. And now it's possible that there could be some very weak interactions between dark matter and the Higgs boson, but these have not been observed at the moment. So, uh, as you know, I like to end those uh, colloquium by a quote. And when looking for a quote for tonight, I, I typed uh, many, uh, many names. And when I typed Stephen Hawking just by uh, hazard, <laughs> he didn't have a quote on black holes, his main uh, uh, you know, subject of uh, work. Uh, you know, the, the quote I found of Stephen Hawking, late Stephen Hawking, was this one. The missing link in cosmology is the nature of dark matter and dark energy. So is that really the one link that we're looking for that could explain At the moment, everything? That's, but that's the open question. But once we re answer that question, we're sure there'll be other ones that will come up. You? <laughs> I have to say that when I was uh, studying in college, I first learned about the dark matter problem. And I said, well, I mean, science progresses so fast, but that by the time I, I am a grown-up, <laughs> I will probably know about that. <laughs> and now we have more mysteries. <laughs> so I don't think we can predict when the answers are found. <laughs> Thank you very much for this nice discussion. I think a big round of applause. <laughs> Il me, reste à, il me reste à, encore une fois, remercier toutes les personnes qui ont organisé ce colloque. Et cette fois, c'est vrai, les interprètes qui sont là-haut, qui font un gros travail. Merci à vous à une dernière communication à vous inviter, pour ceux qui ne l'ont pas encore vu, à euh, passer au Parc des Bastions, juste à côté, à 6h, 7h ou 8h, d'ici le 21 novembre pour voir le spectacle donc vous voyez quelques images ici un magnifique spectacle de 20 minutes euh, aussi euh, dans le cadre de ce Call of Right voilà je vous donne rendez-vous demain avec la conférence de Gabriela Gonzalez et encore vendredi, bonne soirée et merci Thank you.